a soon to be canonized saint said that we all need to live well, but there is an even need, greater need to die well. We'll look at how a devotion to the patron saint of a happy death can help us prepare for that inevitable time in our own lives. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to EWTN Live, a chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And before we get to tonight's guest, I want to mention that today is the feast of St. Maria Goretti. She was born in 1890 and lived a very pious life. And unfortunately, near her house was a man who had developed a problem with lust and he couldn't control it. And in 1902, he wanted to rape her. She resisted, so he stabbed her to death. And while she was dying in the hospital, she made it to the hospital. She was praying for his soul, received Holy Communion, and died in great peace. One of the great things that happened is that this same man was present at her canonization in 1950 um, when Pope Pius XII canonized her. And we need to have intercession to her for all those people who still are experiencing such violence, uh, as, as such as rape. And we want to pray that this terrible crime would be put to an end and that people would not be living by lust, but would be living by virtue. Now, I want to introduce tonight's guest. She has spent years trying to help people make sense out of suffering and death and unite themselves to our Lord and St. Joseph. And she's here to talk about how we can do the same. So please welcome the program director for the Pious Union of St. Joseph for the Suffering and Dying, Sister Margaret Mary Schistler. Sister. Thank you, Father. When we met, uh, you know, as you came here, we found out that we're both from the Sweet Home Chicago. Yes, we are. Yeah, and, and uh, it's great to have you here. And, uh, but you don't live in Chicago anymore. Where are you residing at this point? Right now I live in Grass Lake, Michigan. Where is that? Grass Lake is um, probably just between Jackson and Ann Arbor. Okay. And it's about mm, 45 minutes from Detroit. Okay, All right, so it's in, in that Detroit metro area. Correct. All right. Now, what is the work that you are doing? Presently, I'm the program director of the Pious Union of St. Joseph, and it's a shrine dedicated to St. Joseph, patron of the suffering and dying. All right, so this, this is a very interesting apostolate that, that you have, that you're working with uh, praying for people mm. who are suffering and dying. How did this Pious Association get started? Well, our founder, Blessed Louis Guinella, in the early 1900s in Italy, was founding a religious order. And what he did was he was working specifically in Rome under St. Pius and Pope Pius X. What he was asked was if he could start a church to St. Joseph, because we know Pius X was Joseph Sardo. Oh, yes. And so therefore he asked him, and so Father Guinella did open a church named St. Joseph on Pius X's 50th anniversary of being a priest and his 25th anniversary of being the, the, the Pope, uh, the bishop. Bishop. So what happened was um, he made this prayer crusade and he wanted to start people praying for the suffering and dying. And the Pope says, if you do that, I will be your first member. Oh, okay, all right. Now, what? is the reason to be praying for this, the suffering and dying? What, and, what, and then also, uh, why St. Joseph? Well, 
let's especially today father there's many many people who are suffering we've gone through an economic crisis we've gone through family problems we're going through everything especially today people are praying for saint joseph because saint joseph is patron of a happy death because he was by Mary and, and Jesus at his death. And so therefore we have chosen St. Joseph to be the patron. Right, and, and he has been, uh, as a matter of fact, in the litany of St. Joseph, yes. one of his titles is to be patron of the dying. Yes. This is a, and that's a really uh, sweet thought for us to have, that as St. Joseph was dying, mm -hmm. both Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, and the Blessed Virgin Mary were with him to comfort him. And what a happy death. And there's a beautiful picture of St. Joseph dying that um, the person that started the Pious Union in the United States, Father Germano painted. And what it does, it has Jesus and Mary there. But what greater consolation than to have the two persons that you love the most at your death. We would all want that. Yes, right, right. And, and it's not only the two persons that he loved the most, there's what are two persons to have? I mean, the two best persons our human race has produced. So this is a, a great gift uh, for him. And this is how he became the patron of the dying. Yes, yes. And we, what we did was um, we, we prayed specifically to St. Joseph, patron of the suffering and dying. And what we did was we included suffering, not just the dying, because it's important today to pray for those people who are suffering, because all of us have some sort of suffering in our life. And it's a lot easier to get through things when people are praying for you. Yeah, it is uh, definitely the case. And, and there are many people who are you know, uh, especially because of modern medicine, mm -hmm. they're oftentimes suffering a long time through various yeah. diseases. I, I think especially of many people with cancer, yeah. you know, that they oftentimes undergo a lot of suffering mm -hmm. from the medicine that they take yeah. to help, you know, fight the cancer. Yeah. And so this is a great group of people, and, and some of them are also uh, in the process of dying as much as they fight it. Correct. So this is a great uh, intercession. And what we try to do with the people that we pray for every day, we try to remind people there is a redemptive reason for suffering. Suffering, if they offer it up, it can definitely redeem. It can not only redeem us, the persons who are praying maybe for our suffering, but also other persons in the world to save them from going to purgatory possibly. Right. See, this is one of the things that I'd like you to talk a little bit more about, because a lot of people in our culture see no meaning in suffering. And as a result, they define mercy as killing you. In order to get rid of your suffering, they'll do mercy killing. And for them, mercy has been redefined by murder. And Tell us a little bit more about the, the role of suffering and its meaning. Suffering, just to give you a little anecdote, we started the, the Grass Lake Pious Union. It opened in 1994. This was the time of Jack Kevorkian. We put the sign Who's up. from Michigan. That's right, and everyone knows that he's the doctor that does assisted suicides. Or did a suicide. Did, yes, right. He, he died. He just has this now year. passed on. Hopefully, he's in heaven, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I know. So, in 1994, we put up a, a sign saying, Shrine of St. Joseph, patron of the suffering and dying. Because it was that time, police actually stopped to see what kind of activity we were doing there. Is that right? That is. Did you do anything that caused them trouble? No, it was just the sign that they were worrying about because we were, we were St. Joseph patron of suffering and dying. So they wanted to know if we were also doing some of the activity that Dr. Kevorkian was doing. And so it's just the opposite. That's right. That's right. By the way, it's interesting. As he was dying, he did not seek assisted suicide. Oh, amazing. And I'm, and I'm glad for that. I'm very glad for that. Yeah. Maybe he was conformed. I hope so. Let's hope. But especially today, Father, um, with suffering, even with young children or some of the other adults, when we were growing up, my family, my, my, my teachers, they always say, offer it up. And so that meant that whatever I would do, I would try to endure the suffering as big or as little as it was and offer it up for some special person 
or, or thing in my life. And so that's why that redemptive suffering, that's why it's important, because we can actually sustain some of the suffering and get credit for it for other people. You know, one of the things that I know Archbishop Sheen mm -hmm. used to bring up a lot is how the suffering becomes redemptive, not just because we're undergoing pain, no, no. but because we join it to the suffering of Jesus Christ Amen. on the cross. That's right. And that the mass is especially the place where we take our suffering and offer it up in the, the, the host and the wine so that it can be joined to Jesus by the, by the uh, uh, consecration of the mass and that uniting our suffering with that of Jesus is one of the very important elements of Mass. And it's also important in the Pious Union because our founder has asked that we start a perpetual Mass Association where we would have priests sign up and offer one Mass per year for the suffering and dying. To this day, we have over 83,000 priests signed up. So there's a mass said every day for the suffering and the dying. Oh, did, now do you tell the priest which day to take? Well, to we make actually, sure all the days are covered? Well, when they, when, when they contact the Pious Union of St. Joseph, we've made a grid and it's, it's a 24 hour grid. And so what they do is they will pick an hour where they can say the mass and there's a special intention for that hour. We will sign them up and also sign them up for our, our apostolate in, in Italy. Okay, all right. So now a priest who does that does not need to join the, the order started by mm. Blessed Guinelli. No, no. We, we, any priest, every, every pope has been a person that has signed up for the perpetual mass, by the way. And we're asking many priests, if they haven't heard of this, to please go to www.pusj.org and get information on the perpetual mass. What's that website again? www.pusj.org. Okay, P-U-S-J dot org. Pious Union St. Joseph dot org. Okay. The initials. Good, good. And, and that's a way for any priest in the world. Yes. And he doesn't have to do anything except oh. offer that mass up once a year. For the intentions of the suffering and the dying. And that would be for this, you know, not just for one specific, because nope. we priests typically offer masses for the dead, yep. you know, on a very regular basis. Yep. But this would be for all. Any all, and all the dead. Correct, correct. Dying. Because there's many people out there, Father, that don't have people to ask them to pray for. So, and I think we need to take them into consideration too. And so this is uh, very much a ministry mm -hmm. that is for those who don't have someone to take care of them. Right, and many times we say prayers for the uh, most abandoned souls in purgatory. Well, the thing is, if we start praying for the suffering and dying, those souls may not have to go to purgatory. Oh, okay. So this is uh, preventive medicine. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now the, I noticed in, uh, you've got a prayer book here called The Holy Cloak in Honor of St. Joseph. Yes. And this prayer book is available from the Pious Union of St. Joseph. Yes. Right. One of the things I noticed as I went through these prayers is that there are many prayers for the souls in purgatory. Yes. This is a very common part of it. Right, because our, our idea is that if we pray for the suffering and dying, maybe those prayers will redeem the suffering so that they don't have to go on to perdition. And that's what we're hoping for. Right, right, right. And you know, this is, you know, do you have stories of people who uh, were prayed for and had conversions on the deathbed? Especially when they, they prayed the Holy Cloak. We've had many people write to us. There's one person that has prayed the Holy Cloak for nine months. Now, the Holy Cloak, just explain what that is. Okay. Because our audience doesn't know. Our, 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 our prayer book, book is the book um, to pray in the, the, the Holy Cloak of St. Joseph. And it's named that because St. Joseph will embrace you with his cloak. So therefore, we're supposed to feel comfort. We're supposed to feel um, um, anxieties are supposed to be gone and everything, that he's embracing us. We ask them to pray this prayer for 30 days in honor of the 30 years that St. Joseph was with Jesus and Mary. Okay. So one woman prayed this for nine months consecutively. She told us on the ninth month, her prayers were answered. 
to me, that was very much a, a, a sign, not only the cloak, but the nine months. I told this person, that's rebirth. After nine months of praying, there's a rebirth there. You have to thank God for that. And she says, sister, I will thank you. Yeah, right, right. Beauty. And, and, you, and you hear lots of stories about people praying this uh, uh, holy cloak in honor of St. Joseph, yes. which is the name of the prayers that are included in here. Correct, correct. And people tell you about uh, conversions and such? And what happens was someone, um, her son, had gone off the beaten path. She had play, prayed the holy cloak. She didn't notice anything after the 30 days. What she did was she started it again. After the second 30 day, he was actually starting to go back to church. Uh -huh. She said that was actually a miracle for him. Right, right, right. See, and I, I don't think we should underestimate mm. the role of persistent prayer for those people, it's not that you just ask once. That's right. But persistent prayer, because I think there's something that we learn in that persistence, that as the Lord makes us wait, He's also teaching us something about what's going on in our prayer. That's right. We have to understand that Jesus, we think sometimes, does not answer our prayers. He answers them, but He answers them in His time, not ours. Right, right. And there's, and there's oftentimes, a series of lessons for us to learn while we're in that waiting process. I think it kind of teaches us, first of all, patience. Right. And sometimes Jesus puts us in its situations where we have to practice those virtues that we need to grow in most. Yeah, right. And that's, and that's not a bad thing, so that it's not only praying for the person, it's the person who's doing the praying that experiences conversion too. Sure. I remember just a personal incident. Um, I myself was, had, had troubles with a person. So what I did was I tried praying. Okay, Lord, if, if you would change this person, it would be great. But in the time, I was becoming more tolerant of the person. So Jesus was changing my heart as well as possibly changing the person also. Right, right. And that's, that's something that we should not forget as we're interceding for people. You know, that, that's a very important element. One of the other things I, I liked in this book is that it includes the litany to St. Mm -hmm. Joseph. A lot of people don't know much about that litany. Tell us about that. Well, the litany, first of all, um, we know that the month of March is dedicated to St. Joseph. So our community, what we do is we dedicate ourselves to praying the litany of St. Joseph every day in March. The litany of St. Joseph takes in his entire life, takes in his virtues, and we're asking God to help us to um, emul emulate St. Joseph himself. Right, right. Yeah, we want to emulate St. Joseph and learn his virtues, and by asking him because it would it'd be typical of St. Joseph, most just, mm. pray for us. That's right. Well, that puts the idea of praying for justice mm. in our own life That's so right. that we would be just. Right. And even if you go like St. Joseph, most humble, St. Joseph, most obedient, all of us have those virtues within us that can be developed more. And I think St. Joseph is the perfect saint for no matter what sort of problem we have, whether it's with other persons, with relationships, whether it's financially, he's patron of the family, he's the patron of workers. If we're, if we're unemployed or underemployed, we've found that St. Joseph can be prayed for for any need at all. Well, you know, a lot of people have been losing their housing. Mm. And St. Joseph, I mean, they should turn to him That's right. because he understood it. He had to leave Bethlehem <laughs> and go to Egypt and look for new housing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, a, in a strange country. So he understands that, and then people can relate to that That's experience right. of his. That's right, just his flight, especially the flight into Egypt and things. If we think about it, when he was actually um, with Mary when Jesus was born, what kind of a house was that? So therefore, he accepted whatever God put in his, in his way for housing. Sometimes it's not the best housing that we have. No stables, for instance. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, the, but then going off to another country and, you know, to mm. Egypt, where he wouldn't even speak the language. That's right. Uh, the language is totally different. Uh, it's not even related to, to uh, Aramaic that he spoke. And think of how hard it was for him to live through those instances. But because of his faith and his trust in God, he accepted it all. Yeah. St. Joseph was somebody that we could really follow his example. But remember, not one word did he speak in the Bible. Right. Not right. one word. Yeah, so the, 
Uh, maybe the politicians could take him <laughs> as a patron saint too. Amen, Father. <laughs> a few less words might be a good thing. Yeah. One, one of the other uh, titles for his intercession is protector of Jesus and Mary. And he's also patron protector of the church. Do you have any reflections on that aspect of him? I think that it's excellent for us to think of him as the protector of the family. Because today, especially for the unborn and, and life all the way to, to proper death, he is the protector of life, period. We can pray to him in times of problems because if we have, many of us have people in our families that may be wanting to look, seek abortion, may be looking into euthanasia. Instead of directly confronting the person, pray to Joseph for their behalf. And I believe that Joseph will intercede. Patron of the church, when, when the popes years ago made him patron of the, of the universal church, he spiritually assists us in all of our needs. And I think especially if there's, there's problems within the church and, and we know there's problems, there's people, we pray for them in honor of St. Joseph. You know, one of the other things too that's I think very interesting is there's a, a, a serious problem in American society. I don't know, I don't think it's quite this way in Europe, but in American society, we've been having a very serious problem of single mothers. 41% mm. of children born now are born to single mothers. And that's extraordinarily high. And St. Joseph might be a good patron for the men who are the fathers of those children to take up their role and to, when our sons uh, and grandsons are not living up to their responsibility for the children they father. Maybe to seek St. Joseph as a fatherly patron for them. I agree. And that would fall under the prayer for the suffering of the dying because I believe that single mothers, they suffer quite a bit yes. because there's no you know, significant other in the picture that they can count on for help and assistance. Our, our pious union prayer for St. Joseph is just one sentence. And we ask people um, all over the world if they can just let us know and we'll send them the prayer card. And it is, O St. Joseph, foster father of Jesus Christ, true spouse of Mary Ever Virgin, pray for us and for the suffering and dying of this day. You know, that's, that's a great prayer. We, we need to have uh, someone who is a, a good manly model to help men live up to their responsibility for their family. And this is a very important uh, uh, role for him as well. Think of the man, what he had to go through when Mary had the Immaculate Conception, he stood you by mean the her. The virgin birth. The virgin birth, yes. Right. And when he stood by her, and the things that he was going through in his mind, ah, but he stood by her. So, an excellent example for everyone. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, this is uh, an example that is oftentimes neglected and forgotten mm. uh, when we need him very, very much. That's right, it is. And one of the big things, especially about St. Joseph, was that when it was started in Italy, our founder, Blessed Louis Guinella, he, he prayed to St. Joseph and he trusted in him. He made a church in his honor in Rome, and now it is a minor basilica in Rome called St. Joseph Trionfale. The Pope was so happy with that church, he gave him the first altar for the church, Pope Pius X. Yeah, who, again, whose first name before was Pope Giuseppe, was Joseph. Giuseppe, Joseph, yeah, yes, right, yes. Right, right. It's not who you know, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, sometimes, yeah, it, sometimes is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. We're from Chicago. We know we that. We know that, right? right, right Go right. with those dailies. That's right. right. right, right. Good. Now, one of the things um, uh, your founder, uh, Blessed Louis Guinella, uh, is about to be canonized. When is that happening? He is. He is going to be canonized October 23rd. Of this year? Of this year. 2011. Yes. And Which then, is just three months away. Right, right. So, so I'm sure there's a lot of excitement in your community. There is, there is. And one of the most exciting things is the miracle for his canonization happened here right in the United States. Oh, what was the miracle? Do you know? Yes. What it was was there was a, a young man who was 21 years old, and his friend asked him to go out rollerblading. So he did. 
he went rollerblading and he was going very fast down one of the um, Philadelphia streets and he was going backwards and his friend says, hey William, I can't catch up to you, hold on. So he asked him to slow down, but what do we do sometimes? We speed up to show them that we can go faster. So he went backwards, he hit a pothole, catapulted eight feet up in the air, 15 feet out, came down smack on the back of his head, closed head injury. He was out of it for a while. They took him by ambulance to the Crozier Hospital in Philadelphia. What happened was the doctors said it was so severe that they told the family to come in and to say their goodbyes. Well, they did a craniotomy to relieve the pressure and that relieved a little pressure. So they said, well, he might make it through, but he's definitely gonna be a vegetable. This happened on March 15th. On March 19th, friends of ours- Which is gave, the Feast of St. Joseph. Thank you for recognizing that. Absolutely. <laughs> On March 19th, the mother received two, um, two relics of our founder, Blessed Louis Guinella. She put one on her son, William. She kept one, put it around her neck and prayed every single day to Blessed Guinella. March 25th. Hmm, what day is that, Father? And that is the Feast of the Annunciation. You are right. Very important to us, especially we're daughters of St. Mary of Providence. Um, they started to notice a little bit of an improvement. He opened his eyes. They, the, the, um, the, the healing was kind of go slow and everything. Nine months afterwards, he went to rehab. He now is married. He's smarter than what he was before the accident. He was a, a marginal student. His life is perfectly normal. The family was just so intrigued. One of the miracles that we thought definitely was the fact that the American doctors were willing to fill out all the paperwork for the miracle, <laughs> which was great. Oh, that's great. It is. That's great. So, so this was, and they, they recognized that this was extraordinary healing that was not due to their work, yes. but to the work of God. That's right. And they filled out the papers and everything. And you know the process to go through the cause of saints in the Vatican and everything. Um, what they have to do is they have to present, and there were, there were probably documents, millions and millions of documents. And the medical personnel, the, the, the doctors in Italy, have to recognize that it is beyond human conception that this person was, was right. um, miraculously cured. And the word from the medical people came on the Feast of Our Lady of Providence, November 12th. All right. So we see all of, the, all of God's work in there because the feast days were very important to us. So we took that as a sign. Oh, that's great. So he's going to be canonized this coming October yes. of 2011. Yes. Oh, that's great. Now, uh, this association, just so that people know, it's not just priests no. who can join by praying a mass once a year. That's right. This is open to all the laity. Yep. What we call is the Pious Union of St. Joseph, the members. The members are laity. And what, what they do is they promise to pray the St. Joseph prayer every day. Because as you know, when we're praying for suffering and dying, it's not just a once once a time. It should be every day and consistent. Like you said, the persistence in prayer is what gets us the results. Mm -hmm. So we ask people to write us at www.pusj.org. Tell us that they would like to become members. We will sign them up and we ask them to pray every day for the suffering and dying. That's all. And what they get as a benefit, we have a mass set every week for them, all okay. of the members. All right. So, so that there's a mutual back and forth giving. Yes. You know, people are giving their prayers and anybody can join this. Yes. There are no dues, are there? Nope, no dues. So, so that's a good thing. It's just that's free. Right. That's right. Uh, you, can, you can join uh, and, you, and all you have to do is, is pray for the suffering and dying. That's right, promise that. And then we, because we've made a shrine in Grass Lake dedicated to St. Joseph, patron of the suffering and dying, we have daily mass, rosary, um, stations on Fridays. And so sometimes when people are in the area or even in the United States, they make pilgrimages to the shrine, especially in the month of March. Okay, and, and that would be another way to add to uh, the, the prayers by yes. making a pilgrimage to this. Beautiful. Is it a pretty up there? It's very pretty. Oh, and there's nice. an indulgence also attached to that when they come to visit the shrine. All right, so, so the, uh, and it's an, an indulgence is, you know, praying for the benefits that come from St. Joseph and 
you know, the other saints. Yes. Uh, and of course, our blessed Lord Jesus. Amen. And you can apply it for the dead or for people, the, the person who's doing it himself. That's right. Or herself. That's right. All right. Well, look, we need to take a break. Okay. Uh, we're going to come back in just a couple of minutes. And we'd like to get some of your comments and your questions. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Thank you. I um, want to uh, give you some information about the Pious Union of St. Joseph for the Suffering and Dying. That's the name of this uh, group, the Pious Union of St. Joseph for the Suffering and Dying. Their address is 953 East Michigan Avenue, 953 East Michigan Avenue. And that's in Grass Lake, Michigan, 49240. That's 49240. They also have a phone number you can call. And I hope you have somebody there to answer the phones tomorrow. If not, we have an answering machine. <laughs> uh, you better get an extra machine uh, because people are going to be interested in okay. this. Uh, but it's 517 522 8017. 517 522-8017. And you can call during in the daytime. That's right. Uh, and, and find out more about the Pious Union of St. Joseph. And there's also a website, www.piousunionofstjoseph.org. Or? Or P-U-S-J.org, for the short. Now, we also have a nice group of people here in our studio audience. And we'd love to have you come and join us. Uh, if you can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN, uh, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll help you with places you can stay, scheduling for the masses, for the programs, tours of the network, directions up to Hansville, so that you can see the sisters and join them for Mass. You're going up to join the sisters for Mass tomorrow, right? Yes, I am. Good for you. Good for you. All right. And don't forget that uh, later in July, we're going to have another EWTN family get-together. I believe it's July 23rd and 24th. And it's going to be here in Birmingham. Tickets are free for our 30th anniversary family celebration, July 23rd to 24th right here in Birmingham, Alabama. You can go to www.ewtn.com for more information. Or you can also call 205-271-2989. Tickets are free. And you just come on down, and we'd be glad to have you join us. Be on a TV show, in fact. <laughs> All right, are you ready for some questions? I am, Father. All right, let's uh, go to our studio audience first. Uh, Ma'am, where are you from? Irondale, Alabama, Father. Right here in Irondale. Oh, yes. Yeah, home of the hamburger heaven. Yes. So, uh, what, want, what's your question? I want to know where you can obtain the prayers. Huh. Yes, the Holy Cloak book, if you write to www.pusj.org, then it'll give you the address. You can let us know. And it's um, available for anyone. We will okay. send it to you immediately. 
All right. So, so anybody can get a copy of this booklet yes. with all these prayers to St. Joseph. All right. We have a phone call. We have Joe. Hello, Joe. Hi. How are you doing, Father? Fine. Where are you from? I'm from Staten Island, New York. Great. And what is your question? Uh, my question is that we can pray for the souls in purgatory to go to heaven. But what about those at the last judgment who are destined for hell? Can we pray to put them in purgatory? Um, that's my full question. Thank you. Oh, you don't want that one. You're the theologian, Father. <laughs> all right, all right. Actually, no, you can't. I mean, you can pray for them, but your prayers are to no avail. When somebody is in hell, that's for all eternity, that you can't change that status. Um, if you think of it this way, at death, we become a pure spirit, like the angels. And a pure spirit is like concrete. Mm -hmm. Once it's poured and hardened, that's its, that's its shape. Mm -hmm. Or I, a, a better way I like to look at it, is the prophet Jeremiah talks about us being like clay and God is the potter. Now, if we allow God to shape us, at the moment of death, the clay gets fired and the shape is there permanently. However, if we don't allow God to shape us, but we allow the devil to shape us, or we shape ourselves, we become something hideous and we get fired at death and that becomes a permanent shape. And that can't change for the damned. In purgatory, you know, my mother used to do pottery. Mm. And when she did pottery, you know, when it came back from being fired, sometimes there was a little bit that needed to be filed off. That's what's going on in purgatory. They're mm. filing off the, the, the rough edges and making it smooth. But you're, you're shaped by God and you're destined for heaven. Once you're in hell, that shape remains for all eternity. There's no second chance from hell. So does that help, Joe? I guess he's down. So. But that shows us, Father, there's more reason for us to be praying for the suffering and the dying now to yes. save those persons from perdition. It's possible because yes, if we're is. praying, every, if each of us just prays every day for the suffering and dying, just imagine the souls that we could save. Exactly. You know, and as a priest over the years, I've heard deathbed con confessions. Mm. And, you know, that is a glorious experience. You know, some, I've heard some people say, well, that's not fair. They send all that time that they were in life ah, and then they convert and they get yes. to heaven. It's not a, if, if it was all fair, mm -hmm. I would be in big trouble. I'm glad it's not fair. I'm glad it's merciful. This is not fair, Father. Exactly. The cross is That's not it. fair. This is not fair. It's mercy. And so we want the mercy of God for the dying. Yes. And no matter what sins they've committed, we want them to repent and turn to, to God our Lord and to let them know that Jesus Christ died for their sins. Even if it's at the 11th hour, yep. okay. you know, we want them to be saved. All right. We have a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Well, I'm originally from Scotland, but I live in Florida. Yeah, I didn't recognize a Florida accent, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I work with the death and dying in hospice, and it's a wonderful mission I have. I'm a th third daughter Franciscan, and I, I can relate to the death and dying, and I thank God for the, that he chose me to do this work, and God bless you for yours. And um, so I'm very grateful, Father. You know, this kind of booklet might be a great thing for someone like yourself mm. who's working with the deaf, uh, the, the dying, um, you know, in hospice. Um, this is a, a great opportunity because there are hospice uh, is very important mm -hmm. for the families and for the dying to help them deal with that last time. When my mother was dying, hospice was very helpful to us to show us how to take care of her best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so, but this is also a very good thing for, for that. And I think when they pray the Holy Cloak of St. Joseph, it also strengthens us to be able to minister to those persons. Yes, exactly. You know, that there's, 
and minister not only in giving them the medicine and the mm. cleaning and all that, spiritual. but the spiritual. That's right. Again, not only so they live well, but they die well. Amen. As, as you uh, say. Uh, we have another phone call. I have Marianne. Hello, Marianne. Hi, Father Pacwa. Yes, where are you from? I, I live just out of Boston, Massachusetts. Great. Uh, Father, my question is, when I receive communion at every Mass, I ask that Jesus, that it be as if my sister Clea, her son Peter, and her daughter Lorraine, who are special needs adults, her husband died in 73 and she stopped going to church. She used to teach Sunday school and everything, but she stopped going. And I ask at every Mass, instead of me, as I receive you, Jesus, please be as if my sister Clea is receiving you mm. and her son and daughter. And I wonder if that's possible. I've always wondered. Mm. But at every Mass, as I receive the Eucharist, I ask Jesus, let it be my sister Clea mm. and her son and daughter. Is that possible, Father? Sister, do you want to respond to that? Well, I think with Jesus, I think all of your prayers and all of your desires will be passed on to the person that you're praying for. It's just as if everything that I'm doing, I'm doing for the intention of somebody else. So I do believe that your prayers are being heard by the Lord. You know, one of the other things too, that's very important, is we are members of the mystical body of Christ. That's right. And that your sister may not be going to church, but she is still a member of the church. Mm -hmm. And she may not, for, for whatever reason, that she f probably feels a, a, a deep disappointment or mm -hmm. hurt that God didn't answer a prayer that she had in great need. I mean, she's, she's suffering a lot, mm -hmm. dealing with two special needs children. Mm -hmm. She's going through a lot and she probably feels abandoned by God, so she's gonna show him. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's the way a lot of people are. That's right. But you are still in union with her and she's still in union with all of us. Mm -hmm. And your prayer for her is very important. You know, um, you know, keep on doing that offering. And I think these prayers to St. Joseph, especially this holy cloak in honor of St. Joseph, would be a great prayer for you to pray for your sister mm -hmm. and for her children because they need a, a lot of grace at this point. It's a tough situation, it sounds like. And don't stop praying. Yep, exactly. Even if you don't see anything, do not stop praying. Exactly, exactly. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Hi, I'm from Cape Toronto, Missouri. Good to have um, you here, welcome. Thanks, my thought would be uh, what you're thinking about, if you have a, a family member, a loved one has been on a uh, a lot of suffering on a deathbed possibly for two, three, four months or, uh, and you're not really sure if they've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, you've never really heard them say that. Uh, they're not really a regular church going person. What would be a way to offer up their suffering, your suffering, uh, and uh, of course prayer? What would be your thoughts on that? I believe that what you should do is offer your prayers continually for that suffering person and to pray for them constantly. But I, God will never let your prayers go without intercession. And St. Joseph of all, start praying to St. Joseph because he's the patron of a happy death. And the thing with St. Joseph is that you start invoking him to intercede for a happy death for the person and surround that person for prayer, with prayers. You know, I, I think, uh, that's a very important point that you're making in, in that kind of situation that, you know, to pray for that person, mm -hmm. to find, to, to acknowledge Christ, because, you know, the situation that you're describing is that the person, you know, seems vague yeah. in their relationship to Christ. And you don't want to be vague when you meet Jesus. You know, you're getting ready to meet him. And whether you believe in him or not, you're going to meet up with him mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he's going to be the judge of your souls. You know, this is, this is part of the reality that we have to deal with. So to help a person toward clarity mm -hmm. in their faith so that they recognize Jesus 
and that they're recognized by him. This is very important. And it's also important for us, Father, not to lose hope. The thing is that we don't know what the particular person is going to do at the particular judgment. That person could be, could be flying high in heaven, but we're, we're really not sure. But don't lose hope. Right, right. And, and with maintaining hope, uh, which is not the same thing as optimism. Mm -hmm. I always like to make a distinction. Good. Optimism is a human idea mm -hmm. of what you think could happen that's good. Yeah. Hope is a grace that God gives us to trust that He is going to give us what is good. That's right. And that's a very important distinction. I, I don't like optimism. Mm -hmm. I like hope. Mm -hmm. I want to, the, to grow in the virtue of hope. Uh, and this is a, this is a very important uh, issue to have with the dying. That's right. Is that God gives us hope uh, for, for their souls and for, the, for their salvation. One of the other things um, that, you know, you're doing with this organization and with this, this pious union is by praying for a happy death for others. Don't you think that that helps us prepare for our own death? Oh, definitely. I agree. Because I think it makes us more aware of the other person and we're praying for an intercession for them. But in the meantime, we're getting clarity of what exactly is necessary for the happy death. Yeah. Because uh, again, as your founder said, you know, to live well mm. is a good thing. We want to live well. Yes. And, you know, we want to have a happy life as much as possible. The joys of family, the joys of friendship, uh, security, all these good things. But all of that fades away mm -hmm. in comparison to dying well. And it's most important because we, we, we think that um, happiness is without suffering. And so we think if we're joyful, we're happy. But the, remember that happiness, or I should say suffering, is not, joy is not the absence of suffering, but the presence of God in our lives. Yes. We can have suffering. I mean, I could be a person suffering very much inside, but the fact that I have Jesus Christ, I, I can be happy and still be joyful. A good example of this is Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mm. She had experienced a long, long life of a lot of spiritual dryness, mm -hmm. and yet she was filled with the love of Jesus. Even though she didn't, she, she went through a dark night of the soul mm -hmm. for a number of years, mm -hmm. she still had a love of Jesus. And one of the big concerns for her was very much a love for the dying. Mm -hmm. She would go out to pick dying people out of garbage dumps yeah. and out off the streets and minister to them so that they would die happily. And the way that she could do that was because she saw Christ in every person. And it also reminds me that our founder, Blessed Louis Guinella, always said, have dignity and love for all, regardless of the person. And our basic work as daughters of St. Mary of Providence and servants of charity, our brother's order, is to take care of the mentally handicapped and the aged. So you, have, besides praying for the uh, suffering and dying, you also have other apostolates in yes. your order. Yep. We, we actually minister to the mentally handicapped and we have nursing homes also, the aged. So the thing with that is that we become persons that we're able to do the ministering, but we're also able to pray. So that's, that puts it together. Yeah, that's, that's a, 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 an important combination. I think if you had only the prayer, it wouldn't ring as true mm -hmm. as the fact that you are taking care of elderly dying people yes. and, and people who are mentally handicapped who the world might not see mm -hmm. as valuable, yeah. but you learn to recognize a real value in them. Have you done some of this work yourself? I have. As a matter of fact, Father, um, I have a, a sister with developmental disabilities, and I believe that's where my vocation came from because if she hadn't been in my life, I would have never met the sisters. Oh, so you met the sisters through through my sister, through your own sister, right? And and you joined them 
Yes. And did you minister to your own sister? I did. I did. Um, she's six years older than I am, so obviously I was just a little tyke when uh, she was going through this. But she was she was at a residential facility, and when she came home on the weekends, we did things together. And she can read, write, tell time. Can't read, write, tell time, count money. But she's social. She was born normal, but had high fevers and an ear infection, oh. and then it caused brain damage. I but see. it was great growing up with her. Great. Oh, is that right? It, it gave you a different outlook on life. Well, what about the working, uh, what, what kind of place did you work in, in the home for the aged or yep. for the developmental? Both. Both. I, um, I, I worked in a nursing home, and I'm a nursing home administrator, and I also worked with the, with the handicapped. What we usually do is they, they're separated into small housings of 15, and then there would be a sister in charge of that that was called the house mother of those 15 young ladies. Uh -huh. Okay. And what would be some of the things that you learn most from that mm -hmm. that has affected your ministry now as the director of the Pious Union of St. Joseph? First of all, they accept suffering a lot better than we do, you know. And I think with their limited intelligence, they're not aware of how they're actually supposed to act. You know, they, they, they see the suffering, but they accept it as along the line of living. Um, people, you know, whatever, whatever, they know that they're not the same as the other person, that's a suffering for them, but they accept it. Their religiosity is fantastic. They're so close to Jesus. If you want any prayers answered, you ask them to pray. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of the things uh, that I think is a very important part. Uh, I remember a sociological analysis of history by which it said that societies which reject the mentally and physically handicapped becomes a more violent society. Sparta was a classic example. No mentally or physically handicapped child was allowed to live in Sparta, mm. only the strong. And societies that accept the mentally and physically handicapped tend to be made more gentle by those people. Mm -hmm. And when people say, well, what good is it to have these people? They make the rest of us more gentle. That's right. And they give us a great gift. We have another uh, caller on the line. Hello, Maria. Maria, are you there? Uh, hello. Yes, yes, Father. Yeah, where are you from? Texas. And what's your question? My question is, uh, what about offering the pain and suffering of the person that is sick himself, offering the prayer to Jesus besides own? So, you mean, the, do you want the person who's suffering to offer their sufferings up? No. Or, or like you I'm to praying, offer it up for them? Let's say, if, if I'm praying for somebody that's dying or suffering, what about if I offer the prayer, the suffering that the person dying is suffering also, offering to the pain of Jesus on the cross also? Okay, sister? What, what you're actually doing is you're offering up the suffering that you're visualizing someone to go through. And I think that's also a, a process in prayer that would help. The thing is that you are so aware that that person is suffering. You're saying, Jesus, please take so-and-so suffering and, and use it for the good of, 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 of the world. Mm -hmm. And that would be great. Put, in, put a, a, a specific um, subject with it. Put a specific intention. And I think the Lord hears that. Yeah. I, I think, you know... That becomes especially important when the person is not conscious. Very good. That's one of the things. When the person is conscious, conscious, it's very important for that person to join their will. That's right. That's right. You know, to to doing this offering. Again, I remember when my mother was was dying. You know, she had a very specific family intention uh, that she was praying for. Mm. You know, and that she was offering her suffering up for uh, someone in the family. And, you know, the, and that was her will. And, I, and I, as a matter of fact, we had that conversation. And I asked her, yeah. are you offering this up? You know, she said, oh, yeah, I'm offering up for so-and-so. Sure. And so uh, that was a, a very important part, that the will of the person give themselves over to that mm. or gift of suffering as much as they possibly can. Right. Yeah, but if they can't, then, you know, maybe we can, you know, help them with that. You know, if they're not conscious, 
and we can sometimes if you whisper it in their ear, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm praying with you to offer your sufferings up, you know, that they might hear that even though they can't respond. Yeah. And that's why it's important that we assist those per people on their dying bed because right. we have to do things that sometimes they're, you know, unconscious. So therefore we can keep praying in their ear and telling them that, that we are offering things up for them. Right. Well, sister, thank you for being with us. We've run out of time. Uh, so I appreciate you uh, being here. And I want to give all of you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I just want to remind you, you know, that in the, this being summer and also a difficult time in the economy, you know, the number of donations that we've gotten has been down a bit. It's starting to come back up, but it's still down. So we really need you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay all of our bills. You know, this network is brought to you by you. So please keep supporting us. God bless you, and thank you very much.